mark our spots in 2 Kings chapter number 2, and then um, we'll start off in Ephesians chapter number 5. So uh, mark your spot in 2 Kings chapter number 2, and then we'll go over to Ephesians chapter number 5 is where we'll kick off. Thank you so much, church, for having us in. It's been a blessing to be with you, to get to know you a little bit. And um, thank you for the food each night and all that hard preparation. It, oh, it's been, been wonderful to, to feed us, and uh, what a blessing that is. So those of you that um, uh, uh, did that, made the effort to uh, get food, it makes it a little harder to preach if we eat right before preaching, but, um, but thank you nonetheless. And then uh, we've enjoyed the fellowship with you and, and all that, and just the way that God's been moving. Of course, thank you, Pastor, for having us in. We have enjoyed it, and uh, uh, you know, the drive's not bad. It seems like it would be long ways, but a uh, 45-minute drive, basically, and it's uh, uh, not bad, not been bad getting here each day, and then we feel kind of bad because at night, we're like, okay, we got to, you know, it's late, and we've got 45-minute drive still to get, and and so, um, but um, it's been good, been good to uh, be away. I bet you're excited about Sunday, because, uh, you know, when it's like, it, it, you know, you bring a, a guest preacher and it's like eating fast food. It tastes good. It's wonderful. But after a little while, you get sick of it. You want home cooking again. And so this Sunday, your pastor will be back in the pulpit. And you'll get home cooking again. All right. And none of these, um, uh, this junk food that I've been given to you, you'll get the, the real good stuff on Sunday. And so uh, you'll enjoy that. All right. Ephesians chapter number five, if you would. And and uh, normally I do not do this, and that's kind of let you know where we're headed um, before I get to preaching, but I do want to kind of kick us off here. In chapter number five, as Paul's uh, giving these admonitions to the uh, church at Ephesus, um, here at the beginning of the chapter, he starts off by just talking about the importance of walking in love, and, and um, even, I don't know if he uses the term exactly, but walking in light about... Um, uh, in the importance of putting away the sins of the flesh and, and all that contains there in verse number 3, verse 4, and so forth. And he talks about getting rid of those things out of our life and that we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness in verse 11, but rather reprove them. And then toward the end of the chapter, or about halfway through, and it begins to deal with the home and the uh, uh, the husband's uh, role to love the wife, the wife's role in the home, and to uh, submit to her husband, the children's role in the home. And he continues on in chapter 6 about children obeying your parents and so forth. And then masters and their relationship, your, our relationship with our uh, those that we work for and all those different areas of life. But sandwiched in the middle of those things between... Now, the things we're supposed to put off and then uh, the elements of the home and our relationships with one another. He says here in verse number 14, he says, Wherefore, he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. All right, so if you're sleeping tonight, wake up. That's on the authority of the word of God, I say that. And so he says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. It's important, Paul says here in the middle of this, as he's talking about these things, um, especially putting away the things of the flesh and putting on the, the, the light of the Lord and, and walking uh, in love and walking in the light and, and having the right relationships. And in the middle there, he says, make sure that we understand that the days are evil. Now, uh, we are, of course, living in evil days, but um, the days tend themselves uh, to be evil. And we need to be wise as believers that we are uh, well, as he puts it there, redeeming the time or buying it back, making the most use of our time. I'm sure every employee or uh, employer uh, desires that from every worker they've ever had. Just do your best, uh, work your hardest to get the job done. And, and why? Because time is money, the employer would say, or the owner of the company might say, and, and uh, the time wasted can't be bought back. And it's the same is true in our lives. Our, our Lord wants us to make the most of the time we have. Wouldn't you agree? And, and to be wise about it, to be servants. We're, we're stewards in our life. We're to be stewards of our, of our time, 
um, and how we negotiate that time. We're to be stewards of the temple, which is your body. Uh, it, what? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have in you, and you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, right? And so, so we are to glorify him with the body because we're to steward over it. We're to glorify him with our treasure and uh, steward the treasure that God's given to us. You just took an offering. You take an offering on Sunday. That's an opportunity for us to show our stewardship and also not just in our giving to the church, but even in our regular activities, the things we spend our money on or waste our money on. Are we being good stewards of the resources that God's given to us? And so we can talk about all these different, uh, we're to steward our talents and the gifts that God's given to us. First Corinthians chapter 12 talks about those spiritual gifts, Romans chapter 12 as well, that God's given to us. We need to make sure we're stewarding it. But tonight we just want, I want to spend a little bit of time just us thinking about our time. Are we, do we use our time in a way that is efficient to the glory of God. Let's go over, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter number 2 here. 2 Kings chapter number 2. And uh, many of you would be familiar with this passage of Scripture here. Elijah has been the prophet on the scene for many years. By this point in time, he has um, a servant or a minister, a young man, uh, we would assume a young man, that's ministering unto him that will take his place. And so we go from Elijah to Elisha. And these final days, or this final day of Elijah's life, and we, we pick up in chapter number 2. And the Bible says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah, Elijah said unto, a, or went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went, uh, they went down to Bethel. And notice here, verse number three, the Bible says, "And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel." Now, a little bit of explanation. When we read about the sons of the prophets, it's obvious, or it would seem obvious, and and many people believe this. I believe it's true that um, Elijah, along with men like Elisha, who was with him all the time, Elijah was also instructing many other young men. Now, uh, maybe these schools in these different communities, uh, Bethel and Gilgal and, and uh, Jericho and so forth and down by the Jordan, and, and uh, there would be these groups of men that would gather. Maybe Elijah, Elijah would make uh, a, a kind of a circuit trip and, and begin to instruct these young men. Uh, they were, you know, we'll say it this way, preacher boys, so to speak. They were learning to be uh, prophets uh, just like Elijah. Now, they want to be used in the magnitude that Elijah and Elisha would be used, but they were men of God, uh, young men probably, and learning to serve God. And so here they are when the two of them show up, that the sons of the prophets, verse number three, that were at Bethel, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And as he said, um, uh, uh, and, um, and he said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And again, in verse number five, we see more of these, the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha. And they say the same thing. They say, uh, to Elisha, don't you know, do you know that Elijah is going to be taken away? And and uh, it, you know maybe they they all had this uh, uh, knowledge of this final day, and so they they go on. Of course, Elisha responds, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I know." Verse number six, the Bible says, "And Elisha, uh, Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, or tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan.' And he said, "As as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee." And they too went on, and here again in verse number 7, And the fifty, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. Now, I don't know, because uh, the Bible doesn't tell us, I don't know if this is an accumulation. The first two places they go, they're in Gilgal and, and, uh, and Bethel. They, the Bible doesn't tell us how many of these young sons of the prophets there were, and uh, and we don't know if these 50 in the end are an accumulation of, you know, them following afar off, and they go from Bethel and come to Gilgal, and so maybe, you know, five, six, ten of them followed along afar off, and then, 
and then that group got a little bit bigger with this school. They're all waiting and anticipating uh, these final events in the life of Elijah, and, and uh, but whatever it is, by the time you get to Jordan, which would be near Jericho, uh, by the time you get there, there's now 50 of these sons of the prophets. They've all been students of Elijah, it's presumed, and and uh, they're well aware of the events that are taking place. And, and of course, uh, one thing to note there is that the Bible says that they stood afar off. They didn't get nearby. And so, uh, so it says there in verse, uh, at the end of verse number, um, well, let's look in um, uh, verse 7 again. He says, And 50, of, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went, stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so they too, that's just Elijah and Elisha, went over on dry ground. So if you could picture this, they, these um, sons of the prophets, there's now 50 of them that have accumulated, and they're, they're following, they're viewing afar off, so they can see Elijah, they can see Elisha as they get to the Jordan River, but they're just observing, they don't know exactly what's going to take place, they just know that the Lord's going to take Elijah today, and, and they're, so they're maybe waiting for anticipating what's going to happen, and, and, uh, and Elisha takes, off, takes his mantle and smites the waters, and they may, may or may not have heard even what he said, but what they saw was the Jordan River part, and, and probably got all excited. Did you see that? Did you see? And, and wow, wow, did you see Elijah did that miracle, and they saw them too go off. Uh, and, and begin to go off into the distance, into the desert there. And uh, they begin to, uh, as probably as best as they can, observe. Do you see anything? Can you see anything from your vantage point? Hey, somebody cr maybe climb up that tree or something. And, and you, can you see anything? No, I can't see. I mean, maybe I see some movement off in the distance. And, and uh, so here's Elijah and Elisha over there. And this is when Elijah asked him in verse number 9, he says, And it came to pass um, when they were gone, uh, gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I am taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from, ye, from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And so it came to pass, verse 11, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, a horse of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And notice the next verse, verse 12, and the Bible says, and Elisha saw it, which tells me they, these other men, these sons of the prophets, remember, they're on the other side of Jordan. They're probably trying to see what's going on, but they're not near, but Elisha is there, and, uh, and, and the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord separated Elisha from Elijah and took Elijah up into a whirlwind. And, and Elisha is viewing this. He's actually physically, with his own eyes, observing this take place. But these young men, they're not seeing, the sons of the prophets, they're not seeing anything. Or uh, I wonder if they, you know, maybe saw some cloud formation or something, but they don't know what exactly is going on. When, when, um, when the last time they, the last thing they've seen with their own eyes is when Elijah parted the waters and they went across. And now here comes Elisha. He's coming back. And, uh, you know, there in verse number, um, verse number 13, the Bible says, He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell, on, upon, uh, fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan and took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and the smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten, uh, when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, "The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha." And they recognized, even though I think they had no idea what exactly had transpired across the, uh, across the Jordan. They didn't know exactly where Elijah went, but they knew, they had already known that God was going to take Elijah, and, and they had seen Elijah perform that very last miracle of parting the waters, and now here's Elisha with the mantle of Elijah, 
and uh, just the confirmation of the waters being parted showed that Elijah's no longer here. The spirit that used to be the spirit, the authority, the power, right? You understand? That was on Elijah before is now on Elisha. Obviously, Elijah is gone. And Elisha is now, if you want to put it in human terms, he's now the authority prophet. He's the man, if you would. He's the one that now, I mean, we've been following Elijah, but Elisha is now, I mean, it's kind of like if you want to, Think about it in our terms. Let's just put it in some simple terms. It'd be like, you know, the, uh, there, there's an older pastor, and, and, and then he brings in a young man. The young man's training under him. And then that, that last Sunday, the, the, old, the older pastor retires and moves on. And, and now that uh, new pastor, because he's a pastor. He's now the pastor, you know. And, and, uh, and he, it's going to take time for, uh, for um, you know, the... the, um, the, the uh, respect and all those things that that older pastor had to uh, grow through those years with the people but nonetheless people view this is the new pastor and that's kind of the idea if you would not the exact thing but the idea we all got this and so they're, they're viewing this they see all this and and so notice there again at the end of verse 15 the bible says and they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him recognizing that he is now that authority and then I want us to pick up, I said all that to get us to verse 16, and really the thought, the Bible says, And they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. They, here they are, they, 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 see, they see Elijah and Elisha go across the Jordan River. They don't know exactly what happens, but they see Elisha come back without Elijah. They know that the Lord was going to take Elijah. Here comes Elisha, and they come before him. They recognize that now he is the authority. He is the prophet on earth, and they bow before him, recognizing all that, and they say, listen, um, Elisha, um, <clears throat> there's 50 of us. We're all young and healthy and and vibrant, and we're strong young men, and we have some endurance, and, and, uh, and we see you've come across without Elijah. Yes, yes, you, you did observe that, right? That's correct, young men. And, and, and they said, well, you know, with our strength and with our endurance, uh, how, about, how about we do you a favor? We'll go over there where you guys were, and uh, we'll, we'll go find Elijah's body. We're going to go find where he is at. And, uh, and so... They said, uh, let us go, and we pray thee, and seek thy master. Watch what they said. Let's peradventure, let, you know, that means like, let's just in case, the Spirit of the Lord had taken him up and had cast him upon some mountain. Listen, when God picks you up, he's not going to drop you, okay? So, so man, here, these, these young men, they've, uh, obviously they're not as spiritual obviously, as Elisha, uh, but they are training young men. They are young men trying to uh, be, be prophets as well, just like Elisha now is and, and all that. But, um, uh, but something, and, and they knew, they knew God's going to take Elijah up. I don't think they knew it was going to be by a whirlwind or anything, but they, they you know, they knew that was going to be the case. So recognizing that now Elisha has come back, he has that authority, and they said, you know, uh, 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 Master, uh, why don't you let us go and see if we can't search the countryside and uh, see if Elijah might be out there somewhere, his body. We don't want to leave his body out there. And uh, Elisha is going to respond. He's going to say there, uh, uh, ye shall not, at the end of verse 16, he says, and ye, he said, ye shall not send. It's almost like he says, listen, guys, uh, Elijah's not over there. And the response is, the response is, well, you know, he could be. He was with you. We saw him go over there, and, um, and, and only you are coming back, so he's got to be over there. And maybe Elisha even told them, you know, the Lord, the Lord swooped him up in a whirlwind and took him to heaven. I mean, by the way, a picture of the rapture, if you wonder. It's one of the pictures of the rapture. And so he took him up, and, um, and so he's gone. He's, he's not over there. That, there's no point in going over there. And uh, these men insisted. They said, well, well listen, uh, Elijah, Elisha, uh, what if, we're just saying, what if God picked him up, and uh, he was, as he was carrying him away, 
uh, you know, just the Lord went, whoops, and uh, dropped him in the mountains somewhere. I mean, you know, it can, it can happen. And, and I wonder if there was just, you know, longer discussion than just what we're reading here. And Elisha says, you know, guys, God doesn't work that way. God took him. He's, he's not over there. And you say, I don't know that they had a longer discussion. Well, sure they did. And notice verse 17, the Bible says, and when they had urged him till he was ashamed. That word ashamed there means to be disappointed. You ever had somebody under your leadership, maybe as a parent, one of your children does this, or whatever it might be, somebody asks you for something, and maybe, maybe the kids ask you, um, mom, mom, dad, can we get, um, uh, fill in the blank, can I get this for my birthday? And you say, no, that's, that's too expensive. And they go, please, please, please. No, no you're not getting that for, for your birthday. It's, it's much too expensive, and we have bills to pay. And, oh, please, please, please give it to me. Please, I, I can't go on with life without it, you know, whatever it is. And, and, uh, and they keep going on. They keep pressing and, and uh, keep trying to give in. And, and uh, some people are easily swayed after a while. You start to go, okay, your heart breaks, and, and we'll do it. You know, usually the dad's like, no, I said, no, you're not making it easy. You're making it easier for me to say no, you know, the more you ask. But, but um, you know, that's kind of the situation. It got to the point where finally, I mean, they're pressing, hey, let us, just let us go check. And Elisha's saying, no, it's no point in going over there. If you go over there, you're just wasting your time. Elijah's not over there. And they pressed him, the Bible says, and they urged him until he was ashamed. He was disappointed by it. And finally, there in verse 17, the Bible says, he said, send. And they sent, therefore, 50 men, 50 men. And they sought him, and notice, they sought him three days and then, but found him not. You ever seen, uh, you ever seen the old uh, Andy Griffith show, Gomer Pyle? Surprise, surprise, surprise. I mean, these, these 50 young men, they, they n had no idea what happened. Elijah comes back and probably ready to get to action. He just received a double portion of the spirit that was upon Elijah. He's ready to get to action. He's got these 50 young, strong men that can do a lot of things. And their desire is to go search out in the middle of the wilderness. And I've been out there on the other side of the Jordan River is the Transjordan Mountains. And it's, de it's just desert. I mean, it's just mountains out there. And they said, well, we don't know if the Lord might have taken them up in that whirlwind and dropped him back there in those mountains somewhere, and, and we should go find him, and, and they're pressing Elisha, and pressing him, pressing him, and finally Elisha looks at them, and he says, listen, uh, go for it. You ever been that way with somebody? Press and press and press until finally you're just like, okay, whatever. Just go ahead and do it. Go ahead and, and, and take your time and, and go over there. And I want us to visualize, the Bible says now, for the next three days... These 50 men are off in the deserts. Now, it doesn't tell us here in the meantime what's happening at home. We know what they're doing. I wonder what Elisha was doing for three days. Well, I would guess he's doing what God's called him to do. I would guess in those three days he's ministering to the people back in the, the region of Jordan, and he's, he's, uh, he's uh, teaching, he's preaching the word of God, he's prophesying as God leads him, he's getting things done, and uh, boy, they could have got a lot more work done had there been 50 of them, but there's only Elisha because all the rest went over there to go search out the land, and the Bible says they found him not. Surprise, of course he's not over there. God took him. And notice in verse 18, the Bible says, And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, um, <clears throat> I told you so. Is that what your Bible says? That's what he said. He says, uh, Did I not say unto you, go not? You ever, you ever press somebody for, for something, desire, desire, maybe, maybe even ask God over and over, oh, please, God, give me that, and then, then you finally get it, and, and you're like, eh, it wasn't all that. can't believe I asked so hard for that, and now I got it, and it's almost like, like the Lord says, I told you you wouldn't like it, or whoever it is, and 
And I don't think Elijah, Elisha was just trying to be hard on them, but I would think he was trying to teach them a lesson. Hey, I, I, I told you not to go. For three days, these 50 men, imagine what 50 men could do. 50 young, strong men, what they could have accomplished on this side of the Jordan had they not been wasting their three days. And really, if you want a title for the message tonight, three wasted days. These men had wasted three full days out in the wilderness while Elisha is getting the work of God done by himself. Boy, it would have been a lot better if there was 51 of them. But Elisha's doing what God, he's, he's tarried back at Jericho where God's led him to. These men are off in the wilderness wasting three full days. I wonder how many times in our own personal life we wander off in the wilderness, so to speak, doing things that it's just nothing more than a waste of three days. You say, three days? Um, well, you know, your three days might be ten years. Your three days might be a couple weeks. It might be couple months, it might be years and years or whatever it is, but I wonder how oftentimes, Christian, you and I find ourselves off doing stuff that means really nothing. We, by the way, they thought they're doing the work of the Lord. They're, they're thinking, boy, this is important. We don't want to leave him out there. He's out there and he, he, his body's out there and we want to honor him and their, their assumption is we're doing the right thing. But you know, sometimes we could be doing what we think is the right thing. It's not where God sent us to go. And we think we're doing exactly what, what God would have us to do, but the whole time God's going, I told you not to go. That's not where I want you. And by the way, we turn from there, but back in um, Ephesians, if you still have that marked, I'll just read it again real quick to you. He says there, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know, so oftentimes we can be doing something or things that, that aren't God's will for us at all. I mean, I don't know. There might be another occasion where, you know, if the occasion was different, that God might have sent some men to go search for the body of whoever it might have been. But in this case, Elisha said, no, don't go. It's a waste, it's a waste of time. And they went over there and wasted three days, 50 men for three days. You know, a lot can happen in three days. Did you know that? If, especially if you know your Bible. Like in, in three days, God created the heaven and the earth. God separated the waters from the water and put a firmament in the midst of it. God brought the waters of the earth all together and the dry ground appeared and all the vegetation started up on the ground, uh, the dry ground. In three days he did that and he just did it with, you know, just speaking it. Of course, he could have done it in moments, right? We all understand that. I mean, in three more days, what did he do? He, he created animals and the whales of the sea, the birds of the air. He created man, all these different things. He created the sun, moon, and stars and all that in the second three days. In three days, a lot, a lot can happen. In three days, the very Son of God fully redeemed you and I. In three days, he died, was buried, and rose again for our eternal salvation. I mean, a lot, a lot can happen. Well, I mean, we could go through example, example, uh, uh, example after example in the Word of God of what could happen in three days. Go one more place in your Bibles. Look over in Jonah. Jonah learned about wasting three days too. In Jonah chapter number one, God tells him. The Bible says there in verse number one. Is, I'll, I'll give you time to get there, but in verse one of chapter one, he says, "Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me." And I've always found this fascinating, and I'm sure you have too. Reading your Bible as you're reading through Jonah, he says, "I want you to arise, go to Nineveh, that great city." The, the cry against it and so forth, it's come up to me. I want you to go there, preach. And then in chapter number three, he says the exact same thing to him. In chapter number three, verse one, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. That's the only difference. From Jonah chapter number one to Jonah chapter number three, the only difference is that it says in Jonah chapter number three, the second time. 
Everything else is the same. What did he say to him? Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach in uh, preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I mean, the wording is slightly different, but everything that he commanded was exactly the same. You know the you know what? But but in the midst of the first command and the second time God had to say it, we know that something happened to Jonah, did it not? And what was it that happened? Well, Jonah chapter number one and verse number seven, or seventeen. The Bible says, "Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah." And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. By the way, we understand that Jesus later on would say, as Jonah was in the belly of the well, three days, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the, in the belly of the earth three days and three nights, right? This was a type or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so Jonah spent three days, and by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, a fish is a well. You say, what, what are you talking about? Well, you know, sometimes people say, well, it wasn't a it wasn't, it wasn't a fish, it was a well. Jesus said it was a well. Well, in Jonah, it says it's a fish. And all I'm saying is that the creator called the fish a well and a well a fish. No matter what the animal people say it is, when I see a well, I think that's a big fish. Amen? Anyways, because God said it was. Anyway, so, so Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the well and uh, cried by reason of his affliction, and God had him, had him um, uh, vomited up there at the end of chapter number two, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. You know the only difference between chapter number one and chapter number three? Three days and three nights was wasted in accommodations that weren't very pleasing. Now, I don't know about you, but if I, if I had to stay somewhere for three days and three nights, I'm not choosing a whale's belly. You say, I'm not sure. Do you really believe that really happened? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's in the word of God. I believe Jonah really got swallowed by a whale, spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and got vomited out. And the only thing difference between chapter number one and three was that three days was wasted, and there were some other differences. Jonah stunk now. He still had the same command that God gave him the first time. The command was still the same. I still had this job. The will of God was still the same when all was said and done. The only difference is, is now Jonah's walking around with a bunch of well vomit on him, and he stinks, and he's still got the same job to do. And you know what happens when you and I waste three days and three nights? The only thing difference is not what God's will for our life is. The difference is, is now just you stink. And you had to spend three days and three nights somewhere God never intended you, you to be. But God's not changing his command that the calling and gifts of God are without repentance. It's not like God goes, all right, listen, I didn't know you felt that way about it. I'll just change my mind. No, no, just say, I mean, you, you know, as Christians, we're, we, we need to be careful. We need to, we need to understand God has, God has a purpose for us. And God has a desire for our lives and and, and by the way, even for the unbeliever, God has a, de he has a desire. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only thing difference between somebody that gets saved when they're young, my wife, she got saved in a pastor's home at the age of four years old. Now, at four years old, I couldn't have understood the gospel, but she could. And so she got saved when she was four years old. Or somebody that gets saved at 90 years old, they're both going to heaven. You know what the difference is? is one stinks a lot more when they got saved. Now, praise God, he washes all the stink off. But, but the difference is, is one, she got to more time to spend serving the Lord without wasting all that time or more opportunity, whereas the person at the end of life, praise God, they do it right at the end of life or whatever it might be, right? Praise God, same salvation. The difference is that she got to serve God a lot more and not have to deal with all the problems that, that come along with that. So, praise God. And so, anyway, so, but it's the same is true in our Christian life. How oftentimes... How oftentimes I've seen Christians just, I, I mean, I've done it myself. My own personal life, this is, a, this is an example of my own personal life of running from God and wasting time. You know, God, God never changes his desire for where I would end up. The difference is, is now, now I have some scars that I have to bear as I'm doing the job that God wants me to do. You know, I have some... I have some things that I, I wish I would have never seen or been exposed to or whatever it might have been, and it, all, all we did was waste, waste time in the middle there. 
And I say that, I think about on a final night, I really, you know, I think, boy, there's so many messages to preach on the last night of a revival meeting, but uh, if we could just get this down, if we, just, if we just understand that every single moment of your life is important, that we make the right decisions. I mean, even, even like those, those sons of the prophets, we might sometimes think we're doing God, what God, God's service and doing what God wants us to do. I mean, Paul, Paul before he was saved, thought he was doing the Lord's service, but he found out very quickly it wasn't. And I just wonder, are we waste, do we waste too much time? We're going to get one day, you know, our life, is, our life is but a vapor. One day we're going to get to the end of our life, and when we look back and go, man, there was all these gaps where I just wasted three days there, six months there, ten, ten years there. I could have done so much more for the Lord. I don't think at the end of our life, I don't think, I don't think any of us will be going, man, I wish I would have made more money in my life. I wish I would have gotten, you know, got to go to the theme parks more often. Or, I mean, we might say, you know, I wish I could have spent more time with my children or my family or whatever it might be, but it's not going to be the, play, you know, this, this activity. I wish I would have watched more baseball games. I like baseball. I'm sorry, I should rephrase that. I like the Diamondbacks because uh, you guys all do too. I know that. I don't like just baseball. I mean, I'm not going to watch anybody else play. I just watch the Diamondbacks, and if they're not winning, then I'm not watching baseball. But, but, uh, <clears throat> but I don't think at the end of my life I'm going to go, boy, I wish I would have got more seasons in, watch more baseball. I'm not going to do that. But I bet you there will be times where I go, I wish I would have done more for the Lord. I would always, wish I would have watched a little less. I don't watch a lot of it, but I wish I would have watched a little less baseball and got more reading of my Bible accomplished, more souls saved, and more more whatever it might be. I wish I would have prayed more. I wish I would have invested more time in my children and my wife and, and those that God brought into my life. I wish I, and we can, we can waste time doing all kinds of stuff, right? We can put all kinds of stuff in there. It could be, what do we waste time on? I mean, we waste time on, on, on entertainment, like I just said. We could waste time on, on doing activities that we think God would have us to do, but it's not really God's will for our life. We could waste our time complaining when we could be serving. Sure we can. I wonder tonight if we would leave with nothing else, just, just this thought that, am I wasting time? Is every day that goes by a wasted day? And uh, am I going to get to my in, the, end of, the end of the journey, so to speak, and, and find out that, um, that the Lord's going to come alongside like Elisha did and go, uh, told you not, told you not to go, told you so. All you did was spend 50 days out there. You could have got a lot more done for me with 51, but you left Elisha by himself because you were out wasting time looking for somebody who wasn't even there anymore. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I think the message is thought out and, and heard tonight, and if God's speaking to your heart, I wonder what you're involved in, Christian. I guess that would be the question tonight. Are you involved in the things that God would have you to do? Are you, have you sought out God's will for your life and what you should be doing, and are you redeeming the time, or is it a is it a constant waste of time in the activities? And maybe, maybe tonight you would say, yeah, I, I believe I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. And maybe tonight you would just come and you would just say, Lord, help keep me on the right track. Help find me where I need to be so I don't wander off in the wilderness searching for something that's not there, something outside of your will. Help me to stay where I need to be. And maybe there's somebody else that needs to come and, and just say, Lord, help get me on the right track. Whatever God might be leading in your heart, I'd invite you to respond. Father, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would help each one of us uh, to be faithful with the time, to redeem the time, because the days are evil. Lord, it takes just a few minutes browsing social media to see all the fighting and complaining that Christians are doing when there's a whole world out there lost and dying and going to hell. And we're not reaching them because we're all fighting with each other, thinking we're doing God's will and and yet just wasting time in the wilderness while the devil gets victory out in the world. And so, Lord, I pray with examples like that, you would help find us faithful doing what you want us to do. Pray at the end of this revival meeting, Lord, that you would just help us with the decisions that we've made all week to be wise with them and to redeem the time in every decision we've made and to be committed to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed. Eyes closed, if you need to come tonight as the piano begins to play, if God's spoken to your heart, some are already praying, you can pray there at your seat if you need to. Christian, if nothing else, maybe maybe you say, well, the message tonight really didn't 
target something I'm dealing with, but is there something this week that you just need to come to God with? Is there something that he's spoken to your heart about and you just say, I need to get that right? Whatever God might be leading you to do. See, we can have a revival meeting, but revival really begins in our hearts. God speaking to us and us responding. As God's led you tonight, I invite you to respond. We'll leave the altar open for a few minutes as we close out tonight. I want to ask you to not leave here with any unsettled business. If the Lord's spoken to you this week, would you come and just talk to him? Whatever it may be, good, bad, recommitment, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, in whatever way he's spoken to you, would you come and just talk to the Lord and respond to him this evening. We've got a couple praying and we want to give them time to do that so there's plenty of time. The altar's still open. Would you come? say thank you to brother and miss Cisco and the boys it has been wonderful having you here at church please make sure that you get by tonight tell them how much you've appreciated them uh, how much you are how grateful you are and thankful for you are that they have taken time out to come and be used to the Lord this way I don't know if you agree but the Lord spoke to us this week and um we got, we're entering in a busy ministry season, so let's not waste it. Our three days as a church is the next three months. Well, it's more than that, but we know the next three months. We got a lot of stuff going on, right? A lot of stuff, and it's really easy to get distracted, and it's really easy for Satan to stick his nose in. And Let's not waste it. Let's not waste it. Let's stay excited. Let's stay energized. Stay focused on what we're here to do. We're sojourners. This isn't our home. We're on our way out of this place. Thank you, Lord. I don't <laughs> I want out of here. But we got some very important and special work to do until he calls us home. And uh, so let's just stay faithful. Let's stay excited. Keep the zeal. Keep the, the, the joy, right? And uh, it'll be exciting to watch God work and see how he'll use us. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to close in song. We've done it every day. And uh, we're going to sing it through twice, page 640. Every day with Jesus, we'll sing it through twice, page 640. Every day with Jesus.